Hello, my name is Keegan, and here with us today is Erica Fernandez Zamora, discussing her immigration experience with our very own Jessica Yamas. Erica was born in Mexico and eventually came to the United States when she was in elementary school. Despite the language barrier, she maintained a 4.5 GPA throughout her entire high school career while living on her own. Hi, I'm Jessica Yamas, and I'm here speaking with Erica Fernandez Zamora, and we are going to talk about her experience as an immigrant to this country. How old were you when you moved? I was 10 years old uh, when I migrated uh, and reunified with my parents in Oxnard, California. Um, where are you from? Where in Mexico specifically? Um, I'm originally from a small town called Gomez Farias, Michoacan, um, and Michoacan is the state of Mexico. So how did you come here? So I, like I mentioned, I reunited with my mother. Um, my father put in the paperwork to uh, sponsor uh, the family to obtain a green card. Um, initially, um, it almost took 10 years. So uh, the first time that we were uh, called in to see if we were all uh, were able to file for a green card, um, only three members of the family were able to um, gain their residency, their legal residency. And so because it was a long process and very expensive and there was seven of us, um, including my mother, he, my family had to get into a lot of debt to file all the paperwork, like the passports and everything. Right. So they decided to um, uh, have my mother and my two older sisters uh, come to the United States with my father. Unfortunately, my brother, even though he's the oldest one, he was not able to get um, residency because he was over the age limit of 21. And so him and, um, and my two other sisters, uh, we were sent back to Mexico. And so we, uh, we were in Mexico while my family were in California. How old were you when you were um, separated from your parents? I was eight years old, my little sister four years old, and my older sister, the one that was with us, she was 13, and my brother 21. Wow, so being so young, like being separated from your parents, what were some of the challenges you faced, especially since you were only a child, basically, and you had to like raise your little siblings all by yourself? Especially, was it difficult for you, especially for your younger siblings? Well, you know, I think I, I'm going to share a little bit of, of our story and so to, to, to make sense of, of the question. So I grew up in a small, humble town in Mexico, and so there were not a lot of resources. And like I mentioned, um, my brother, there's, I have an older brother, and then there's five uh, female, uh, or I have four sisters. And uh, we grew up in a very conservative small town where women don't have a lot of rights and also like we are supposed to be housewives. So since very young, we learned to take care um, of like the shores and learn how to cook. And um, because my father had already migrated many times to the United States and for many years, uh, my mom taught us how to um, basically be independent and to help each other survive. And, and since very young, I, I work along my siblings in the fields of Mexico to, uh, to provide for survival and to feed ourselves. And so even though I was only eight, I had already matured really quickly because of the necessity to survive. And so um, the way it worked while we were separated, I took care of the four-year-old in the morning while my 13-year-old would go to a school. And then when my sister, my 13-year-old sister came, I would go to school and she would take care of the four-year-old. So we learned and we, my mom made it seem as the separation wouldn't be forever. So it kind of motivated us that we were going to, some, some way, somehow we were going to be reunited with them sooner rather than later. And that reunification took a year and a half. So it was a lot for a child. Um, and it's still, it's hard to think about living separated from my parents, but it happened and it unfortunately happens to many families. Um, what was education like in Mexico? Like the differences between education in Mexico, because obviously there's a huge difference, unfortunately, and the one here in the U.S. So uh, because I was in a small town, the expectations, for, especially for young women, were very low. And, and why is that? It's because there were not a lot of job opportunities. Um, there was only, only up to seventh or eighth grade. You were only able to get 
in the small town to those grades. And if you wanted to go further, you needed to go to the biggest city, the closest biggest city, and wow. you needed to afford having a car, which we didn't. We actually, in our house, we didn't have a flushing toilet. We didn't have like a refrigerator. We didn't have a stove. I mean, we are talking that there was, we were very impoverished, but having said that, we still, my mom still wanted us to learn um, and, and to go to school. So even though she never went to school, she still found value. And so she would send us, even though like, for example, for me, I would go in the afternoon shift. Even when my mother was there, we would work in the morning from, very early in the morning to, until one, and then I would go to school from one to six. And uh, by then the teachers were already tired and they also didn't think that you were gonna get, make it out of the town and that you were gonna be a housewife, so why invest in you? And that was the same mentality that my my father had about us and also my mother's father. And, and unfortunately that was the case. So uh, having said that, um, yes, education was very different because of the uh, of the expectations they had. And um, and when I came here, that was all I could do. There was no need for me to work and it was illegal to work as a child. Wow. Um, going to school, um, you were used to, I think you said earlier, you obviously you went to school, but your siblings had to go work, some of your older sisters. Um, were your sisters like, were they just kind of like unfazed by it or did they, were they upset or they just knew that there was a need to go to work? Well, in Mexico, we all had it to work. And, and if you were little, you contribute less, but you still were working. And, uh, and I feel that that's actually something that I found very positive. Now that I think about, it was difficult to be working as a child, but that meant you spend a lot more time with your family. You, you were with them most of the time. You learned to be independent, to work hard, the, the importance of our work. Um, and I think that's what I learned a lot of life lessons through that by working with my siblings and, we, and, and them too. I think, unfortunately, they didn't have the opportunity because, like I mentioned before, it was not expected. So I think that's all they needed to do. And so I think if they had had the opportunity and they were like, uh, support it, to do it. I think my siblings would have done it too, but out of necessity, they did uh, had to work uh, much younger and for longer years than I did, right? Right. Um, what do you think would have been different if your parents had it, uh, moved and taken um, a f their family, you, with them to the U.S.? What do you think would have been different in your life, your families? Well, many things, especially like, for example, just to even have a conversation looking you in the eye or be able to think about just to share my emotions and to tell you what I think about uh, st stuff in general. I think it would have been hard because um, usually in my household at least, and I knew it was true for, for our community, young women did not have a voice. I mean, even my mother did not have a voice. Uh, if you were born a woman, you were, um, there were already some certain expectations of you and there were very different expectations. So I feel that um, I would probably have been married, which I, and, and had kids, which is usually what happens. Um, I, I don't think I would have been able to continue my education due to the circumstances where we were um, because we couldn't afford it and there were many of us and that meant that uh, there were a lot of sacrifices and I'm, I'm sure that we would have continued to work hard. I think mom has taught us really well the importance of hard work and never giving up and perseverance and um, so I think that would have continued. Uh, my parents, at least my mother, did a lot of, yeah. of that showing us by example. She didn't taught me how to read or to solve a math problem, but she taught me those those life qualities that have helped me throughout my life. And to, like, for example, not to be afraid to fail. And so those things, I think, um, I would have carried them here or there, but I have to admit that the opportunities that this country opened, um, they're beyond what I could have ever thought because we came in and we came out of necessity, not because one day we decided that we're leaving everything behind because there was not a lot that we left behind besides our family, unfortunately. Um, I wanted to talk about, after you came here, obviously you went to school and um, you, uh, your parents had to move. 
and you stayed behind what made you uh, make that decision so as an as an immigrant to a new country we experience a lot of difficulties from learning the language to adapting to a new school systems um, but we also uh, face a lot of opportunities to change the cycles of poverty and uh, and I'm not saying that um, that actually education it's an equalizer I know that many people have said it it's not you just still have to work really hard <laughs> as an immigrant in this country especially as a woman too um, but I do um, I think thinking back um, I, I, when I was young and, and when I made that decision, the reason I was able to make that clear decision and I, get, I would say the most important decision to stay behind in Oxnard and not to live with my parents um, to the Valley is because I wanted something different. I wanted to show my family that there was another way that we could be successful and that it, there was a, another way to live life beyond just being in survival mode. And I think, honestly, then I didn't know how I was going to do it. I, I, there were a lot of ifs, but I definitely had the persistence. And again, that's something that I learned from my mom, like, okay, I'm just gonna do it. And uh, they moved out of necessity too. My father got sick and mom couldn't afford paying the high level servant as a farm worker in Oxnard. And they didn't have a choice, but I did. I did have a choice. It was probably their worst decision. <laughs> it was my best decision, but because they wanted me to stay in the house until I got married and that didn't happen. But now they know that it was the best decision I could have done because it, we started to think in the long term and then the short term. Um, did your parents ever come to terms with you leaving or were they, what was their reaction? Were they very upset? Obviously now they look back and they see um, what an amazing person you become, all of your achievements, and they say, wow, that, that was a great thing. But like uh, back then, did they, what, what, what did they say to you? Well, I think, I think I don't know if my parents were ever <laughs> like, um, how do I say, straight out say, you know, we are so proud of you that you left home. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but I think there is that, I, I think there is that pride in them that after all the sacrifices they have done that uh, it has paid off. I think back then they couldn't see it and I, and I don't blame them because the way they grew up, the way they grew up with the expectations, the way sometimes this country has the expectations of immigrants, especially Mexican immigrants. It's, um, and, and, and with the rhetoric that now we're experiencing is that we don't bring uh, something to this country. And in and, and reality, we bring a lot. We bring um, a lot of initiative, a lot of hard work, a lot of intelligence. And I think my parents didn't know, didn't know better. And I wish they had support me. It would have made life much easier. <laughs> a lot of decisions might easier, easier, but um, I don't blame them and I thank them also. You know, if they had not been the way they were, I, I don't think I would have like be as stubborn <laughs> and, and to push as hard as I did because I think I could have given up so easy if I, I, I had that option too. I could have just not continued my education. I could have just gone with them and work in the fields, but I knew that I wanted something different. And even though it took a lot to give up uh, as, a, as a young person, um, through, that, through community organizing, I learned to believe in myself and find the voice that my father and many told me I didn't have to make that decision and to actually stick with it and not look back. And until this day, that's the best decision I've ever done. Since you didn't live with your parents, where were you living at the time? Did you have someone that supported you while you were 15 years old, going to high school, and you were living on your own already? Well, I, I have always, I don't think I would have made it without the support of a lot of amazing people, and they're still here in this area. I think I thank them a lot. Um, initially, I, um, I was planning to stay with a sister, and um, with my sister and, and, and her husband, and then she had a child, but. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out, so that was the first surprise on my own. I thought I had it figured it out as a 15-year-old, um, but it didn't work out because my, my brother-in-law had the same expectations as my father, that I was probably going to end up pregnant and that he didn't want it to be his responsibility. And so he basically, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to stay with them. And so um, looking back at the story of my 13-year-old sister that took care of me in Mexico, she was the first one in the U.S. that went to um, graduated high school, the first one in our family, and then the first one to go to um, Oxnard College. And she, 
by then she was at Cal State Bakersfield and she was the first one to say, you know, I'll pay you for, for the first couple of months of rent while you find a job and we'll go from there. And yeah, thanks to her, she paid me for the first couple of months of rent. I uh, share a room with an eight year old that a family allowed me to, to share because I couldn't afford more. And I started doing that and going to school as a normal student. No one really knew that that was happening. I was still involved in that community. I still was playing sports. I still was like in every possible club and starting clubs and and doing community service and um, and just doing well. Like I just wanted to be a well-rounded student. And um, and then after that, there was not enough room. Um, there's a new member came to the family, and then I. I left and live in a garage uh, with with no lock. Um, but um, but then after that, um, a lot of more opportunities came up. I said my involvement in that community and also doing other programs with the migrant program. I went to a a summer program at UCLA and I met someone who helped me find um, a better job and and a better and, and another housing situation where I was renting. A room and uh, and I was in better shape, but that was until my senior year. So I went around, I moved around, um, but I really never made it um, as it was. I was very grateful for the people that opened their houses for me and allowed me to at least try to graduate from high school. Thankfully, I graduated with honors and 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 with a full ride scholarship to one of the best colleges in the nation and in the world. So. Back then, I wouldn't, I would have thought that that was the case. I just worked really hard, and and, and it worked out. <laughs> it worked out. Uh, it absolutely did. <laughs> um, so you had a four point five in high school. Were you were you? So you had a rent. So you were also working, and you had all these clubs. Yeah. How did you manage to do all that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think. You know, I I was just one of the things I learned since very little was that if I set my like if I set a goal and I work really hard and I think maybe that that's where actually sports helped me a lot. I think sports actually helped me survive, especially running. So actually, I didn't get to running just because I wanted to run. I was just running around all the time. And when I joined soccer, um, I remember I had never played soccer, and the coach gave me a chance. Many people have given me chances and believe in me, so I think I owe a lot to them. And he said, you know, I will let you play in the team, not because you have any skills, but you can run and have good grades. And so that was kind of the turning point. I started like uh, focusing in sports um, as much as I can, but I was also working at the Boys and Girls Club, working as in, a, in, a, in the Swami on, on the weekends and also in a restaurant. So I was all over the place. I was like, the only thing I didn't do, I think it was sleep. Wow. <laughs> but I was trying to, you know, I didn't know that I was going to make it to the place I made it, but to like Stanford and with the full ride, but I worked really hard. And I gave up a lot of things as a student. I think some of my teachers criticized me because I was, I was not spending time with other students, that I was antisocial. Um, I, I was discriminated in some of my classes because of, of, of where I came from and, and, and my grades and stuff. But I, I think I, looking back, that made me actually more, made me more strong and, 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 and push through. If you ask me if I would be able to do it again knowing what I know now, it would have been hard. It would, I don't know where I got that strength that pushed through, but I always um, give credit to my mother. I think knowing that she was able to raise six children pretty much by herself, um, with not knowing how to read or write, um, that I, I always made me think that I could do it, knowing that I had so much more. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so you got a full ride scholarship to Stanford, which is just how you mentioned, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Uh, how did you, come across this scholarship, obviously you had a 4.5, like being such a prestigious student and all these achievements, it wasn't very hard, but obviously you worked very hard to get there. How did you come across the scholarship? So the program that I referred to that I did at UCLA, not only did it help me to find a better housing or a better job, but it also gave me uh, the opportunity to think about the steps that I needed to to do to make it to, to college. So. When I did that program, it was the summer between my junior year and my senior year in high school. So 
I, there I learned that I could go to college and that I could be fed there because that was a month that I didn't have to work because we were living on campus and a month that I didn't have to pay rent, right? And I didn't have to pay for food. So, um, and part of what the program, it was for 100 uh, migrant students that were in, in, in path to, uh, to like, uh, for your college, but that they, they needed just the extra push and, and that they needed the, to know about the, the, the requirements. And in that case, we talked about the SATs, the ACTs, and then we talk about financial aid and scholarships. And so in that program, that summer, actually they talk about the uh, Bill uh, and Melinda Gates Millennium Scholarship. And that scholarship, I don't, I don't think they long, they, they, I don't think they longer have it, but back then it would pay up to 10 years of your education. It would pay up to five years of undergrad, two years of master's and three of PhD. And wow. so I was one of a thousand recipients across the nation to receive um, that scholarship. However, because I also, Stanford was offering uh, a full ride too, but that scholarship made it, um, I could have choose, chosen to go anywhere and he would have paid for it. Um, so I, I, that's how I came across. Did I thought about me receiving it? No, but I did apply. I applied to a lot of scholarships thanks to some of the counselors that I still um, owe them the, the long hours in their office looking over my essays again because I was an English language learner. I had only been in the United States for seven years when I applied to college. So I was still learning English. Um, and I still needed, depended to work really hard to, to, to catch up to my classmates, but I still did it. I never put it as an excuse to like do well. That's, that's truly incredible. You managed to push ahead out of everything like that you've been through. I think that's really an inspiration for all of us, especially us students, to see what you've done and hopefully um, people watching can take from your story and apply it to their daily lives. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate your words. <laughs> I know, thank you so much for coming here to um, be interviewed. It's really my pleasure to be able to be here with you. No, thank you. The pleasure is mine, and, oh. and it's great to always come back. <laughs> um, another question you said, you had a lot of people in our community supporting you. Um, what do you think today our community could do to support um, immigrants or people who need help um, learning uh, students who don't have housing or students who have any type of difficulties, what do you think, especially for migrants, which is very difficult, learning a whole new language, getting used to a new country and all the different, like all of our different customs, which are um, different from obviously the ones in Mexico. What do you think our community can do to kind of close that gap? Well, I think there, were, there are many things we can do collectively, I, but I could mention at least a few um, that at least for our family um, were incredibly uh, fundamental to to our survival. I think there were people that opened their houses to us when we initially came, and usually immigrants they sometimes they do have family here, and sometimes they don't. They don't have the social capital that many have, also the the economic capital uh, to to survive. And um, and so I think for me, just whoever could offer like more financial help to do it whenever they can. Um, but I think what, what it is more most important for me was that people believed in me. I think, like I mentioned in earlier in, in my story, is that um, some of us grew up with very low expectations. And the, the last thing we need is other people to think and continue to stereotype and generalizing that not because one immigrant does bad, that we're all bad immigrants. And I don't think... Uh, I think we come to this country to better our lives. And I think that's true for at least my family and for many families that I know that they come and to work hard and to make their lives better, but to make this country better. This country is much better because immigrants are actually working really hard. So I think believing uh, in, in, in students, it's, it's, it's one of the best things we can do to uplift them because sometimes we don't have that support at home. Having support in schools, it's great. Um, and in the community too. I think one of the things that for me was very surprising when I did my master's, I, I did my master's in education and I realized that it took me a master's to realize that I wasn't the problem. But the problem sometimes was the way the system, the school system is set up, where a lot of immigrants, students fall through the cracks. For example, 
um, not providing enough resources so that they could learn English um, and, uh, and also not giving them the opportunities. A lot of the opportunities I had is because I made them for me. I, I remember my mom didn't know what I was asking her, but I did ask mom sign this paper and that was for me to um, go into honor classes. And yeah, if I had a way for my teacher to recommend me for honor classes, that wouldn't happen. But if you look at my a transcript and look at the grade and look at my work, I was able to perform. Maybe I was I had it to work harder, but I had I had the potential, and I think that's what we need. We need to um, believe in people so that we um, we rise to the challenge and to the occasion, and we'll do it. We are very capable people and very smart. And not because we have an accent doesn't mean that we have an accent when we think. Absolutely, I think that's unfortunate that a lot of people have a stereotype towards immigrants, like no matter from where, from South America, from Mexico. Um, and unfortunately, they're kind of made scapegoats sometimes. And just because, certain, just like you said, just because certain people do things does not mean that that's how like we all are, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to talk about maybe your experience. Were you ever, um, I, you were talking to me earlier about how if you walked into a room, most people would probably um, assume differently until you started telling them about your achievements how you went to Stanford, just based on your looks, they would say a completely different story from what your amazing story truly is. Well, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we, in whatever country, I could say at least it's true for Mexico, it's true from now the United States and other countries, like I started abroad in Spain and, and other places that I have trouble and realize that when I come into a room because of how I look, like I said, on how I sound, it's automatically there's um, a set um, judgment or <laughs> a prejudice or something. But um, and I also don't go around telling them like where I went to school or yeah. where I want to make sure that people learn to just like people because of who they are and not because of where they come from, where they went to school. Unfortunately, our culture is so based on 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 just seeing a color in the skin and make already an assumption of you or or just how you sound. And I want to change that. And that's why I'm, I embrace who I am. I embrace my my Latinoness. I embrace my Mexicanness, <laughs> whatever it is, my, my indigenous look. I am very proud of it because that makes me who I am. And there is indigenous blood in my blood. And so I will... I will embrace it and I will continue to fight for communities to be able to embrace who they are and for immigrants who are coming for a better uh, opportunity or for refugees too um, because I understand and know what it means to be a, um, in, a, in a country that no matter what you do, no matter if you go to Stanford or not, you will always will be an immigrant and that it's always um, this it seems that you always have to play catch-up game, but it, it shouldn't be the case. We all are doing our best to make this country better, and I believe me, I have done as much as I can to make it a better environment f for everyone who's in this country or wherever I go. Absolutely. Um, kind of going off of that, uh, I wanted to talk a bit more about your achievements, because I know like when you were 15, you staged protests and you actually managed to um, do something for environment, which was, I believe it was a gas pipeline that you, um, they took down because of your, or actually no, they didn't take it down, but they didn't put it up because of the protest you staged. And being only, I think it was 15 or 16, I think that's absolutely incredible for anyone to be able to do that. Well, I think I, whatever organizing and activism, I know it, I owe it to that experience. And I, coming from a very small town in Mexico and knowing that we had to value our resources, when I came to this country, the, the, what I could say was the same and it was true, it remained true, was for me my love to take care of our nature. <clears throat> my parents always have worked the land. I worked the land myself. I was a farm worker in Mexico. So always we knew we needed to take care. And in this case, we had a beautiful beach um, right in our back here, right? It was three miles, but still, yeah. right? It's, a, it's pretty close. And so, but it was dirty, it had trash. So I went to a beach cleanup day and learned that there were a lot more issues than just trash in the beach. Um, there were polluting um, um, 
there were power plants, there was a Superfund site, and then there was this proposal from for a liquefied natural gas facility to come in uh, to the southern part of Oxnard, and it was going to only impact the immigrants, um, predominantly monolingual Spanish speakers, or uh, we had people who spoke indigenous language and, and also from Mexico. And so we knew that it wasn't right. And back then, when I started organizing, we were a small group, and as I continued to get older too, um, it was a, a, we continued to to make the 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 fight bigger because the company didn't want to give up, and so it took us four years. And so when I started was I was I was twelve, and it took until I was sixteen. But that meant I was organizing people from my community, door knocking. And back then, like I said, I was still learning the language, but it didn't stop me. If I said if I cannot speak to the English speakers, I will speak to the Spanish speakers, and I will inform them about their rights and about what's going on in their community. And so that's what we did for four years. We organized, we mobilized, we informed people, we told them, we invited them. And finally, um, there were hearings where I was chosen to be the youngest spokesperson and, and it went really well. We were able to defeat, the, back then, the largest mining corporation in the world. And that basically opened so many doors for me. But the most important achievement of that is that I found the voice that like I said, my I didn't have at home and I didn't have in society. And since then, no one could take this from me. <laughs> I would say what I think and sometimes people may not like it uh, and may not agree, but at least I could say I, I can say it. Yeah, that's truly incredible. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about something that's very prevalent in um, the news, especially right now, um, the caravan that just came from South America. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I support um, I support it. I think I feel that people will not leave their countries uh, if in case they felt threatened either by violence or poverty. Um, I could at least speak for myself that our family left because of the lack of resources. And I I remember my parents didn't ask us if, at least the younger ones if we were come if we wanted to come or not. We didn't have a choice. And I know there are many families that are coming from Central America, from El Salvador, from Honduras. I've been in El Salvador. My, my, my husband is from El Salvador. And I know the struggles and I know how difficult it is. And in part is because of, of U.S. policies in Central America and, and other parts of the country and other countries of other parts of the world. And I feel that until we stop doing or making policies that impact other countries, then we should uh, expect these things to happen. And then we have other issues like climate change. Many, many uh, people are going to start moving and migrating and looking for uh, to, to be refugees because they cannot be supported in the places there are. So I, I'll stand with immigrants. Um, as an immigrant to this country, I have found a way to give back. And I'm sure that uh, if giving the opportunity um, to them, they'll be able to give back um, and, and, and a better um, opportunities for their children. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I am Jessica Yamas and you are watching ECTA.